Uh, so welcome. This is the December 1st, 2020 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. We'd like to call the meeting to order pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order concerning imposition on strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. Meetings in the town of Upton are being conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided in the order. Um, so today we will uh, go in order of the agenda. We've got public comment, which we'll hold uh, right after this opening. Uh, I'm gonna go over some meeting minutes. We have a poll hearing. Uh, we have a uh, an amendment to the license and permitting fees, uh, a renewal of annual licensing, some motions and indeed acceptances to go through, uh, some charitable funding requests, a review of the town hall policy, and we're going to open up the town meeting warrants as well. Um, with that, uh, I will open it up to any public comment. And uh, for those that may not be speaking, I would just remind you to please mute your phones uh, so that we can minimize any background noise or disruption. Obviously, if you want to talk, take yourself off mute. Um, and I would like to open it up for any public comment. I would like to start with the comp about a public comment about the um, request for the overhead power at 25 Maple Avenue. Okay. Um, that is is that associated with the poll hearing i believe so okay yeah we can we we absolutely value that's that's a public hearing so we'll we'll certainly take public comment during that as well um so yes we'll 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 take that we, we want to make sure we get to that is there anything that's not related to the first item on the agenda just general uh other general feedback or comments okay perfect so um with that, do I, uh, Sandy, need to reopen the uh, public hearing meeting? What's the protocol for that? I believe you have to reopen it from the adjourned session. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, just got yeah. Okay. So just reopen it. So uh, I'd like to reopen um, the uh, poll hearing. Uh, for overhead power uh, at 25 Maple Street uh, at 7.04 p.m. Uh, December 1st. Um, so as folks uh, know, this is... If I could uh, interrupt you for just a minute, I don't think you can open a hearing early, but you can open a meeting late. So I don't think we can open it, even though it's just a minute, I think we have to wait till 7.05 legally. Derek, is that true? Uh, yeah, technically, we have to wait one more minute for it to officially open the hearing. Hi, Brett. Now take this opportunity. Mike Howell, attend yeah, the no, meeting. Hold, hold on. Oh, well, is this a public comment, Mike? No, just saying hi. Oh, hey. Thanks. Okay, 7.05. So I'd like to reopen the uh, public hearing. Uh, for the for the poll hearing at 25 uh, Maple Street. So this is a poll hearing that we uh, started during the last meeting. There were some questions. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that folks had the opportunity to get the information they needed. I think that people have had some conversations about this. The purpose of these hearings is to uh, assess the Board of Selectmen's role in, in this process is to uh, provide insight and access and as, as to any potential safety risks or concerns that putting in the new polls may have. So um, examples may include uh, if there's a new poll being placed uh, in a neighborhood or at an intersection, there may be an opportunity to have the DPW involved or the police chief involved to evaluate and assess safety in terms of sight lines. Um, Occasionally, residents can show up and ask for um, uh, a street light on a particular pole. So that's 
those are some of the standard types of things that come into play with safety. Um, as folks know, power is, a, is, a, is something that's a public utility and it's governed by the Department of Public Utilities. So they have their own guidelines and safety standards that they apply. And the National Grid um, Organization is responsible in part for ensuring that any application and any pole or utility work is in compliance with those standards. Um, so that's just just a little bit of uh, background and context for what these what these poll hearings are and what the scope of authority of the Board of Selectmen is. So with the public hearing open, um, Valerie, you wanted to uh, share some comment, and we'll take whatever whatever comments folks have. We'll we'll hear them before we uh, take a motion. Hey, I. Um received the request uh, from the as it a butters request a few weeks ago and it was quite vague and it did state it was three phase overhead power and that was in a kind of a cryptic um, message the the way it was abbreviated so if you didn't know how to read it you wouldn't know what it is but three phase overhead power is for a big operation and where where they haven't applied for any permits at this scope in a long time. I did research that. They they did this time. And I wonder what else is the scope of their project besides poles and the big barn that they put up. Well, it's a barn-like structure in the few silos because it is, although that side is zone commercial, the rest of the area is residential and the schools are very close and i'm concerned about that those are my concerns what other activities are going to go on now that you have a new three phase overhead power that's a lot of power and what type of material is going to be there uh, stored there that's going to be fed by this power so and yeah. it's um, i'm we're all close to it it's yeah. often it, small yeah for, for sure, and any time that there is uh, any type of hazardous chemical coming into you know any property in town, it's something that folks take very seriously. Uh, and I certainly know that our um, fire department yeah. and, and uh, the police chief and some of the fire engineers, the assistant chiefs, have been involved in regular meetings uh, with the Grafton Upton Railroad about the facility, about the expansion that they're doing. They're putting in, you know, a dozen or so additional spurs. They're putting in that uh, new building that has several holding tanks for chemicals of various sorts um, that are being installed. Obviously those require power or pumps, et cetera. So um, this isn't a, a, a property or a use hearing per se. Um, those are certainly valid questions, but I don't think that there's anything beyond the scope of what uh, the town's been actively partnering with the railroad on in terms of safety. I know that I think it was just today the uh, fire chief was over there again at the railroad uh, in meetings reviewing all of the safety protocols being put in. They also have a list of all the chemicals um, that are planned to be on site and how to mitigate the risks associated with each of those. So, um, you know that information is is available. It's it's good to ask, but I don't know that there's any additional change to use um, that's that's planned, and it certainly wouldn't be part of this this poll hearing. Hey, hey Brett. Yeah, well, well, hold, hold is, on. Valerie, does that yeah, answer? Yeah. Um, my my last my last comment on that was so, so if it's uh, since we're all about safety. And us as the taxpayer footing the bill for that safety right now. I know they pay their thirty. The landowner pays their thirty-five thousand in tax a year, but that's actually only like a little bit less than two percent of their overall taxable value that the town has set for them. So maybe as taxpayers, we need to maybe vote on a pilot or a TIF program for them, where the where they mm -hmm. pay the town for in a in a for a payment in lieu of tax or a tax incentive financing program for maybe both the landowner and the the trucking company because because the landowner is a good steward and they did the right thing with the wetlands and that's recorded and they finished that with the cleanup and the the capping of the landfill 
but the landowners, I think it's beyond the landowner. I believe it is the lessee, the, the, the trucking company that's who has a lease with the landowner giving them this right to do it. So maybe someone else needs to help us pay for the safety in some type of other financing beyond the 35,000 we get annually in, in property tax. Something to think about. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Steve, Mr. Byrne. Thanks, Brad. I just wanted um, to bring some people. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, did you call on me or Steve Byrne? Oh, uh, so I, yeah, given the, yeah, so uh, either one, I was calling on Steve Byrne. So Mr. Metallion, why don't you hang on until we hear Steve. Okay. Go ahead, All Mr. Right, can Byrne. you hear me now? Yeah. All right. So I, I think you can, um, I thank you for continuing the hearing. And I think the extra attendees here are because of, of me going around and just kind of notifying people of what was actually, what was going on in the opportunity here. Um, I'm not. I don't. I don't know if Derek or anybody had a chance to talk to uh, town council or anything, but I think that this is a little different than your normal kind of safety hearing about uh, a pole being put up and and putting it somewhere else. And let, let me kind of explain why. This this typical request for overhead power would normally have happened um, after there were planning boards, um, other site reviews done and that, that isn't the case for this this project so um, as I stated before I think this, this is really a an opportunity for the town to you know ask those questions get those answers that they may or may not um, be getting I know, I know you mentioned the fire chief was there um, I, I hear different things you know talking to different people in town and that's the reason why I'm attending the hearings um, so I, I thought you said that there was going to be someone here from Grafton up in railroad that was going to be able to explain the expansion and and provide the details that that you haven't provided or we haven't been provided. Uh, yeah, and we have that that person here that I'm sure can answer questions. Let's. Uh, is there anyone else that uh, we want to hear from the public? Make sure we understand everybody's input, and then I think we can invite Mr. Milanowski to make sure that he's answering and addressing all questions. So let's get all the questions uh, on the table, and then we'll we'll. Uh, get whatever answers are, are required uh, in addition to what i hey Brett John. jonathan Caliano's 116 south street how are you good thanks hi i have some questions um number one what chemicals are being uh, transported into upton i want to know what they are um i want to know how they're going to be stored i want to know what precautions are going to be taken uh, because all of these things as you may know uh, don't have to be made public um <clears throat> i want somebody to go on the record tonight to tell us, the citizens of this town, what is happening at this facility and what their plan is. This is our only opportunity to address this issue. You have no other right uh, because they don't have to seek any other approval. So this is, you are the gatekeeper tonight. Unless you know what chemicals they're bringing in and you can assure every one of us in town that we're gonna be safe, um, I've got some serious concerns. Yeah, no, that, that, that's understood. And Valerie and Steve, obviously, you know, we understand that, right? The the town council let us know that whole hearings aren't a way. First of all, this isn't a use use hearing, right? So in terms of jurisdiction, um, you know, that's out of the scope of what the selectman's role is in a, in a whole hearing. That said, you know, we have a very open relationship. We have an open dialogue with with the folks that run all the businesses in town we we have a healthy relationship with those folks and i know that you know everybody wants to make sure that the people that live in the town understand and are comfortable with all of the businesses that are operating in town and this this business is no different um certainly the the fire chief and the fire department are involved in understanding and know what each and every chemical is what the different mitigation protocols are and the safety protocols are for each um you know obviously nothing is safer than no chemicals in town but if you're going to have these types of uh industries and businesses in town then all you can do is follow the, the protocols and the very stringent guidelines which which i know talking to the the fire chief personally that they have exceeded a lot of what this the requirements are um so this this isn't mr callion to your point an opportunity for us to uh, legally provide any leverage to, to the Grafton Upton Railroad, right? This is simply a poll hearing. 
Our town council has confirmed that for us and what the scope of our authority is. And the scope of this meeting isn't to uh, address the use, to interrogate uh, the business. All of that information we can get, it's available otherwise, it's not being withheld. Um, uh, and so we just have to engage in those conversations. All of that said, I don't know why we wouldn't open it up to, to Mr. Brown here, who is uh, a representative for the Grafton up in Melrose, and he can um, share any information that he has uh, hearing relative to not only the poll hearing and the safety of the poll, but anything else that he might be inclined to share at this point. So, Mr. Milanowski, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you if you're, if you're able to hear me. Yes, Mr. Chairman, more than happy to go down and answer those questions, but I believe it was Stephen, and I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Madad, Madad, Madeline, that had some questions, and I just don't want to start until you've heard from all the public. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Matalian is a, a fellow Board of Selectmen member. Oh, uh, go, ahead. Okay. go ahead, Steve. Did you have other questions? Yeah, you want actually, to I was just going to put out some, some basic information, just uh, uh, Valerie actually kind of to address something that you had mentioned. And also, uh, Mr. Colliano had asked about, you know, chemicals and, and things of that nature. And it's just some kind of overview, just some basic uh, information. The fire department at this point in time has secured some software and a computer that will interface with the railroad so that they will be able to monitor what chemicals are on the facility. Um, I don't know the names of the chemicals. I'm not a, a chemist in any way. Uh, I can't speak to that, uh, but that is, again, that's something that came up at a BOS meeting probably six months ago or so after a series of meetings, something where, again, that was a safety concern uh, by public safety, our public safety officials, and that was something that they secured. Uh, so, again, they have a better idea of what's on the premises uh, at any given time. And, again, uh, what the mitigation issues would be if there were, you know, some sort of a safety accident. And then the other issue I was just going to bring up, um, again, Valerie, you had mentioned earlier about uh, taxation. Um, probably less than a year ago, I believe when this project, the expansion had come before the board, one of our members from the uh, Board of Assessors had talked about taxation and what the increased level of taxation would be after this, um, after this, um, expansion of the project took place. I don't recall, it was again, probably a year ago or so, I don't recall the exact number, but there's probably gonna be well over $100,000 increase in the taxes paid by the railroad. Now, I don't know if Mr. Milanowski would, you know, can speak to that at all. It's probably a bigger number, maybe an additional 150,000, I don't know that. Um, but again, I think that's something that the Board of Assessors in conjunction with uh, other town officials will work towards uh, something along, you know, trying to figure out what that number is going to be. So I just, I, I just wanted to throw that out so that we don't, uh, you know, we understand that this isn't something that, uh, you know, just kind of came up in the last couple of weeks. This is an ongoing process. We have a working relationship with the railroad, and uh, this is again a step in the process. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the community. And first, let me begin by stating for the record, my name is Michael Melanowski. I'm the president of the Grafton Upton Railroad, and I took over that role several years ago. Um, in that time frame, um, actually, before I want to, before I get to that, um, I, I do want to address Valerie's concerns, Stevens, Jonathan, and I think you had some good questions, and I do want to try to address those to to my ability tonight at this meeting as part of our, our open transparency that we do with uh, Grafton officials. I'm sorry, with Upton officials. Um, this this hearing tonight, again, is just for electricity poll hearing, just to connect power to the new building that's there. Um, this project is not going to be um, changing the use of the site. It's not gonna be bringing in different chemicals or other products that are already existing on the site. Uh, it's basically to take a safe facility and we're making it safer and putting in more infrastructure and more redundancy in there to better protect um, both the 
the operations and also the surrounding areas. And we've been doing that in conjunction with public safety in the town. So for the last couple of years, um, this project again has been, been ongoing for well over a year and a half, maybe two years. Uh, we have been meeting on a regular basis with public and safety officials in town, as well as the town manager um, to talk about the project and to incorporate concerns and issues that your public safety officials who represent you have brought to our attention. And I will go over some of those again. Again, I'm, I'm going to take a broader perspective than just a normal poll hearing because normally this is a yes or no vote. And, and at the end of the day, that's what it'll end up being. But again, there's some legitimate concerns and I've been asked to kind of speak of that and I will. Um, let me start also and talk about our relationships with MassDEP. And MassDEP, uh, we have uh, had on the site several times. Uh, we have walked and worked this whole project through uh, MassDEP's review. And, you know, our and my philosophy is that on any environmental standard is that I'm going to meet or exceed what is required. Uh, yes, uh, Valerie, I think you said we're not required to pull permits because we're not creating value to products. We're just transloading. And under the Interstate Commerce Act, you know, just as tractor trailers drive through your town, the same thing applies to railroads that they can move product back and forth. We're not manufacturing anything on the site. We're just taking out our large containers, putting it onto smaller containers, and then sending it off site to manufacturers or companies that need the products. Our products range from uh, Yankee Candle Wax that comes in uh, that's, that's in a solid form that we have to heat up and then send out to Yankee Candle to, to turn into candles uh, from asphalt products. Um, we bring in hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we bring in alcohol to make hand sanitizer that's desperately needed uh, for the um, for the COVID epidemic that we're all facing. Um, and again, those are just a sample of some of the products come through. There are more, um, and the public safety is aware of all of those products, um, and they know they know what their responsibilities are for those products. Um, we are not actually adding product to this project. Again, it is taking products that are currently transloaded from a rail car into a tractor trailer directly. And now they're in some cases, they're going to be transloaded from a rail car into a storage tank and then into a tractor trailer or into smaller containers to be brought off site to be used by the end users. So. Again, that's that's the operation that happens there. This is an expensive expansion. Um, all of the piping that is put on the site is all stainless steel, uh, as well as all of the pumps that are there. So I think, as Stephen had mentioned, there's there's certainly going to be some additional tax revenue that will be coming to the site, uh, and that's something that you know, upon full build out, the assessors will come in and review. And 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 tax at the appropriate rate as they do every other business within the town of Upton. Uh, we're no different than that. We pay taxes on all of the activities that happen on the site um, as required. Um, just for the record, we do not pay taxes on the main rail line going through because that's considered street. Just as there's no taxes paid on the streets in town, uh, but that falls under the transportation aspect. So. The dirt under the, the main tracks, uh, that is the only distinction that there's no taxes paid on that. But all of the buildings and the equipment on site uh, do have uh, appropriate tax being done. Um, you know, going back to DEP, as I mentioned, we, we, we meet or exceed all of their requirements. So we have DEP on the site on a regular basis. Um, we have an open line of communication. Um, matter of fact, and, and I know Derek can attest to this, and he's heard it before from the DEP regional director, is that we're the only railroad, railroad that actually returns their calls, is that we could hide behind our, our preemption and not return any calls, but that's not how I operate, and that's not how the partnership that, you know, as, as we go forward that we want to create with the town. Um, Moving forward with some of the activities we've been working with the town on, 
And I think, Valerie, this may address one of your concerns, is in working with the public safety, we've gone through and analyzed sprinkler system that's going to be required for the building, how that flow is going to take place, and how containment area is, and what the tonnage usage uh, would be coming into the site. Um, at a strong recommendation of the town manager, uh, one of the things that was identified is that line was originally going to be fed off of Depot Street, uh, coming off of Hartford Ave. And what was identified, as, as the selectmen already know, is that that piping system, although you're required to supply the fire suppression to any user, any business in town, has some uh, structural integrity issues uh, that you know will need to be replaced over time. Uh, so instead of using that, which we're totally allowed to do, is, and again, at Derek's recommendation, um, we offered to come in and actually upgrade the town system by bringing in two connections off of Maple Lab and then, in essence, looping it through our site that connects to Depot Street. So now, in S in S instead of just having one fire suppression component for the site, we will now have three different ways for water to flow to the property. And that then provides opportunities for the town that when you go to repair lines, is you have more cross feed and flow uh, throughout the community that we will end up giving um, easements to the town to come in and you know utilize that line going through our property. That's just one of the partnership items that we're working on. Uh, you know, in the future, um, you know, and it's not going to happen until next year, is that, as mentioned, we have moved forward with closing out the landfill. So structurally and, and, and engineering-wise, that's been completed. And with no issues over the last, I believe it's eight years that it's been closed down. However, it's still not technically closed down because there has to be a land transfer because when the landfill that was being utilized by the town and others before we bought the property um, went on some of DCR land. So the state actually has to transfer some land. There has to be a land swap and that has to occur before the final close out of the property. And again, we'll be talking to the selectmen and others in the future about how we continue to partner on, you know, the shared liability of that landfill going forward that today the railroad has taken the bull by the horn and and close that out to to eliminate further contamination. So I know I've gone a little long-winded here, but I, I, if there's anything I wanted to get across to you is that this is not an expansion of any products that we're doing. It's the same uses that are there. We meet or exceed all of the regulations that we're required to follow. Uh, we have DEP and town officials on the site on a regular basis. We don't have to do that, but we do as part of our open communication and, and collaboration. And, you know, we have picked up expenses uh, for infrastructure upgrades that are going to help the town in the long run. Um, and this is the direction that, that, again, I'm taking the railroad and working with all parties on that. So I hope that that answered some of the questions. Um, I'm just looking at my notes right here to make sure I didn't miss anything from Valerie, Steve, or Jonathan. Um, but I, I hopefully have addressed um, some of the items that you have raised. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Milanowski. Uh, any questions, any feedback, right? This isn't, this is an open dialogue. So let's make sure that we're, you know, asking and answering whatever questions we have, both between sort of citizens and the board and, uh, Mr. Milanowski and, and anyone else which is, you know, we should have as open and transparent a conversation as is required to have people be comfortable. Yeah, this is, uh, Dana Larson, can you hear me? Yes, hi Dana, go ahead. Yeah, I'm from National Grid. Um, this is just supposed to be a poll hearing. It's not supposed to be about <laughs> everything else. What's yes, going on with the town? This is for the poll. And yeah. I have another meeting in about 20 minutes. So if we Fair can enough. possibly get this going. <laughs> yeah, Th thanks Mr. Larson. Um, so anyone, uh, questions, answers, uh, Again, we want to make sure that we we address whatever questions you have. And frankly, if this isn't the forum to do it or we don't have the time here, you know, there isn't any reason that we can't commit to taking information, answering questions, 
and making sure that the public knows uh, as much as anybody else uh, around in terms of what's what's going on. This, I know, you know, people think this is the only opportunity because this is what draws people together because letters are sent out, but but there is no limit to the amount of opportunity we have to, to engage with uh, business leaders and business owners in town to ask questions. So people shouldn't feel like this is the one and only chance to have questions answered. Um, so let's, I would encourage that that's something that can happen on an ongoing way. But with that, uh, other other comments, questions, feedback, please. Sounds like so, John. Yeah, I want to say uh, thank you, uh, Selectman Seamus. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I think you realize that uh, the importance of this is that uh, rarely do we get a public opportunity like this. And uh, uh, this is a very rare opportunity, although it's in the context of a poll hearing. Um, we really don't have many opportunities like this with regard to the railroad. And I think you'll all admit that and understand that, given the the uh, the way the railroad is allowed to operate uh, uh, under federal guidelines. So um, I appreciate you uh, understanding that and allowing us a little more leeway. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Milanowski giving us his time and, and the information you gave mm -hmm. us tonight. But I, I want to bring it around to two points you made, Mr. Milanowski, just to make sure I'm clear um, and that you said things that were um, uh, very important to me. Number one, you said this is not going to be an expansion of anything you're currently doing at the railroad. Um, expansion in terms of any additional chemicals you're going to bring in. Um, and I also take that to mean expansion in quantity. Um, but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, sir. Um, so I want you to clarify that for me if you could. And also tell me in the range of chemicals, give me the worst chemical, the most hazardous chemical that's currently at the rail yard. Um, and I think the most innocuous is probably wax. Uh, but I'd like to know what is the most uh, dangerous chemical you folks bring in uh, today. Uh, Mr. Milanowski, you're you're muted. Are there uh, other questions uh, that folks have? We, we've I've written those down. We'll give Mr. Milanowski a chance to answer as well. Um, Steve or hey, Valerie. Brett, yeah. yeah, Brett. Can I just can I just mention one thing? Thanks, Mr. Milanowski and the selectmen. So I I really was the one who. I'm driving this and this was really um, as Jonathan hit on this is what I thought was one of the only times that we could actually um, have this kind of dialogue and um, aside from what Jonathan mentioned I, I think the only item really that that is concerning to me about not not the expansion not the federal preemption is really the health and safety and um, Mr. Milanowski you mentioned something about fire protection uh, I'm just wondering you, you mentioned the the building itself um, but with the additional spurs and everything else, what type of yard level suppression is there? So if, if you know, some sort of emergency event happens to one of the cars that's there, um, I know that that's been a concern previously. And, you know, I, I could just, you know, I live, I'm in a butter. I'm one of the people who got the notice and um, that that's a concern to me. Um, we've had one, one event, one scare here already, um, but, the, the fire and explosion goes to what Jonathan asked about the most dangerous chemicals, but that is, uh, you know, you can take care of the building, that's that's good, but there's a lot of stuff outside in the yard that could probably also use some suppression, and that's that's kind of what my my bigger concern is. The, the building itself is great. I'm glad that you guys did the water line. That's very, very good. We appreciate that. Um, that water line can also be used for that yard level suppression as well. Great. And, and Valerie, go ahead from your perspective, please. And I did um, capture for, that as well, Steve. Thank you. From, from my perspective, I have a front row view of all the activity that goes on there. So, and I have a front hearing view of it also. Um, I am glad that the land owner and Grafton Upton Railroad are respectful of that. And I appreciate that perhaps the trucking company that they utilize should be aware of their level of, of standards. Maybe that's a little disconnect we have with the trucking company and them appearing to feel like they're railroad and um, the railroad doing the right thing and the trucking company perhaps tarnishing the railroad because they have read all the things about the railroad, and the stewardship, the the clean DEQE file that's going to be put on there, the brownfield cleanup, everything about it's very good with the landowner uh, and the Grafton Upton Railroad. However, the trucking company that they utilize is possibly not at the same 
character standards that the railroad is, and that should be something that should be discussed for safety, because that's possibly where the disconnect is. That's what I see firsthand every day. And Sunday night, 11.30, my house is on video. I have this video footage. I have it. I see it. It's been going on. They need to check it out. Okay. That would be helpful. So I've got uh, the exact worst chemicals from Mr. Kalianos, um, clarifying that it's not just no new chemicals, whether or not there's going to be more of those same chemicals. Um, the yard safety, Mr. Byrne, is what you mentioned, not just inside the building. Uh, and then, uh, Valerie, it sounds like you have some questions or concerns with the way that Dana is operating um, their resources in and out of that site. Mr. Milanowski will let you address those as you see fit now. Regardless of how they were addressed now, um, we make sure that we'll take these as, as follow-ups and, and follow up with folks directly, uh, either in this public forum or in another forum, to make sure that we get those questions answered and have that dialogue. Uh, with that, Mr. Milanowski, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Sure. So uh, with the, the caller uh, 01 as, as identified here on the screen, uh, his two questions, um, we are not expanding our chemical line. Uh, there is no intent to do that at this point, so that is staying there. As it relates to the quantity, is the quantity ebbs and flows based upon the economy. So at times, some products go up, some products go down. I, I can't provide any more information than that because I can't forecast you know, what, what goes up, what goes down. I mean, a case in point is that um, the wax business has been suffering through COVID because they closed down the uh, Yankee Candle for for several months. But on the flip side, our alcohol business to buy, uh, to make um, hand sanitizer has gone up. So again, those things have been flow, but again, the, the, the important piece here is product line. We're not expanding that. As it relates to the chemicals that are there, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of every chemical that is on site. Uh, your public safety officials know that. What I will say are two things that hopefully will put your mind at ease a little bit. First is the site itself as being a land, former landfill. When we went to redevelop that, we've actually put slurry on top of many aspects of the landfill where our operations take place. That slurry in essence turns into concrete. So in essence, the whole site's on a concrete pad, even though there may be dirt on top of that for a foot or two or some, some ballast, underneath that it's a concrete pad. The second, as it relates to the, the chemicals, the worst case scenario, or the worst chemicals that are there, we do not transport or have on our line any um, chemicals that are considered uh, vapor that if you smell them or inhale them, that you know you will have serious health issues. Those, those tanker cars go up and down um, the Worcester main line, um, but they don't come on our main, our line at all. On the whole Grafton and Upton Railroad, we do not utilize any of those chemicals that you would see on a rail car, and it would actually have a skull and crossbones. So we do not utilize the most dangerous chemicals. I gave you a range of what we have on the site. Uh, but again, more importantly, the public safety officials know of that. Um, as it relates to... Um, Let's see, we had a health and safety question, I believe, uh, was, was raised as well. Um, there, there was the yard our, safety. Our, oh, the yard safety, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, yes, so actually uh, at, at, at the recommendation of the town manager, he kind of um, suggested this would be in our best interest. And after we looked at it, we agreed, is by connecting Maple Street with two points coming off Maple Street, to the water main, that now allows us to have water, uh, two different lines, in essence, uh, circumventing the whole site uh, through where some of the individual rail cars are stored, um, so that with these improvements um, that, again, benefit the town as well, is it provides broader coverage to the entire site that was not initially planned uh, when we first began this project, we were just going to connect to Depot Street. So, Steve, to your to your point is that this now provides better protection to you and neighbors because we have more water suppression on the site from different areas with more hydrants 
than was planned before just coming off a of depot street. Did I answer all the questions? Yeah, that's that's great. I think we will, Valerie, probably have to have a separate conversation about Dana because we need to understand specifically sort of what the issues are, what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, and we can we can talk through those. So I would, would respectfully ask that we take those ones offline because I frankly am very curious about what those are myself. Um, yeah, so on that, I have, I have, you know, ability of, of re seeing whatever issues that are there. I just can't comment without knowing specifically what they are. But again, I would like to hear more about that in the future. And as the chairman said, we will appropriately address that uh, because, you know, as running an, a railroad is we want to make sure that the facility is safe um, and environmentally sound uh, for all parties that are there. So I, I know, Mr. Chairman, your person from National Grid has to hop off. Uh, so I, I, unless there's any more comments, uh, just let me know. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And I know um, Mr. McKinney does have a, a, a question. So is there a question from, from Mr. McKinney as well? A comment? Good evening. All right, go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Yes, good evening. Uh, a resident here in Upton, and I have property on Maple Avenue. And... Uh, my concern is, are there any future plans for Maple Avenue and the intersection of 140 with the increase uh, of trucks and the expansion? Every morning we're faced with uh, tractor trailers coming from a Grafton area, trying to get into Maple Avenue. They drive up over the sidewalk. People trying to go through that intersection have to back up, let the truck come down their right on their side of the road and uh, continue on. People are very courteous, they're very nice. They kind of expect it every morning because they're faced with it every morning. And it's the same commuter over and over. Is there any plans as far as the town is concerned to expand that road? Is that the reason why we got telephone poles we're gonna relocate, power we're gonna relocate? So is there an expansion of that road? Width-wise, intersection-wise, Maple Ave, 140? That, that, yeah. that is that that's not part of the uh poll expansion and the poll hearing it's a it's a it question is. no not at all not at all this those, those two things aren't connected those are very valid points and things that we have had some conversations about in terms of the impact on on road infrastructure of of the work um but again that along with valerie's question about specific uh concerns regarding dana i think we'll put those in a bundle and make sure that we address those in another forum um for sure, we won't lose sight of that. Um, are there other questions related to the, the poll hearing that we can address so that we can get this um, taken care of? Go ahead, Mr. Metallion, you have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to, quick question, and this kind of arose at our last meeting, and while Mr. Larson's online now, and for folks that are listening, three phase power is on lower Hartford Ave now at the property. But my question for Mr. Larson is, is three-phase power also on Maple Avenue as well? Is it, is it um, I believe, or I thought we had heard at the last meeting that there's already three-phase coming in from the Maple Ave side. This is an opportunity to just bring it in from the lower Hartford Ave side. So uh, could somebody just clarify that? And the question really is just to uh, uh, bring the residents online, uh, you know, kind of up to speed with what we're, what we're thinking. Steve, I don't think Mr. Larson's on anymore, but I, I can explain. There is three-phase power on Maple Ave. What the railroad is doing is they're just tapping in and they're getting that three-phase power right to their building. So this is this is coming right off. If you look at the top of a pole, just a little education. If you guys look at the top of the pole, if there's three lines at the very top, that's three-phase power. So essentially what they're doing, which is kind of why this became something that I was thought this was a leverage point was, that would normally be all covered through planning board and everything else. So the fact that they're asking the town for the for the approval to do that would normally just be a, a yes no vote. I a thousand percent agree with that. So, Mr. Battalion, they they it's it's there. All they're doing is they're they're getting it instead of their single phase that they have now. They're going to have three phase right to the building. So that what's on the street is going to go right to that facility. Right, and as I mentioned last time, in my instance, it's not on Route 140 in front of my shop. So it's you know it's a good opportunity. If it were, we would ask for three-phase power on our property. So it's um, it's a, it's a nice option that three phases on Lower Hartford Ave. It's it's not you know 90% of the town wouldn't have that, most likely. All right. Any other questions? Go ahead, Maureen. 
No, I'd just like to thank Mr. Milanowski for coming tonight and answering questions and concerns of the citizens that we have here. And I think we're ready to vote on the polls. Great. I, I would second the uh, the gratitude for folks, both, uh, you know, Mr. Byrne, Mr. Kalianos, Ms. Leonardo, uh, Mr. Milanowski. Having these kinds of conversations is is really important. And again, that's out of context for a poll hearing, but we appreciate everybody's flexibility and engagement. Um, I wouldn't discourage people from asking these questions outside of these public hearings. Um, we are, we, you know, we, we control the agenda for the Board of Selectmen. We can have as many public conversations as we want. Um, I wouldn't expect we'd need many because we can get the answers that, that we're seeking, um, but want to appreciate everybody's time. So with that, I will take a motion. I will move that we allow the poll, um, the three phase overhead power from poll 65 to rise to poll 65-1 on customer property at 25 Maple Street to support poll 65 at 45 foot JO push brace P6589 is to be installed approximately 15 feet southeast on town property on November 17th on uh, December 1st, 2020 at 7.05 p.m. Maureen Dwinnell, aye. Uh, second the motion, Stephen Metellian, aye. Brett Simus, aye. It's unanimous action. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, appreciate thank you very much. Yep, thank, thank you. Folks. Much appreciated. Yep, important. It's an important dialogue. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Next on the agenda, we have the uh, license and permit fee schedule um, amendments. Uh, so Steve and Maureen uh, were able to take a look at that. Any questions that we have for, for Derek or anyone? No, I've gone through all the fees and everything. They look fine to me. And the addition of the pharmacy's pouring permits. I, I did wonder what that was. I, I, I'm curious. Yeah, I was curious if we had, did we just not have section 19 in our normal fee schedule uh, with with uh, with regard to liquor licenses? That's a brewery. That's, yeah. that's correct. That's why so we just needed to add that. It's for the brewery. Yeah. So, and so um, Rushford is done to address that. It. And so it's different because they're actually brewing the beer. It's a different, it's a different type of permit than just dispensing the beer. Right, yeah, I mean, and that's the license that was approved from the um, ABCC, and that's yeah. how it's categorized. Got it. A foreign so it's the only change on the license um, schedule. Got it. So any anybody, so and I guess partly I'm asking is for future reference. If another brewery wants to come to town, they could still apply for the license under this. Right. This isn't specific to one business, this is something that can be utilized or just as applied that was absent from our, our fee schedule. But now we've added it and anybody. Correct. Can it was. Correct. It was absent. Yeah, got it. OK. And just another follow up to that, Brett, is uh, the way it looks that it's written here. This only allows for the sale of their own brew, their own brew. Right. They would not be able to actually sell any other brew there other than what they brew themselves. That was a so question. The, the farmer's license? Yeah, does any? Yes, that's, yes, there's not, it's not a retail license, it's a farmer's brewer's license. Okay. And that's what was approved by the ABCC. And you, you approved that um, at your meeting when um, they submitted their application a few months back. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious how that, in other words, if there was a, say, an idea for a co op or there was another brewer that wanted to sell at that location, they could not do that. I guess is what I was Correct. trying to trying to get around to. And then my only other question was, is that fee schedule, is that recommended by the ABCC? Um, I just didn't know if that would be more in line with, well, I suppose it would be in line then with a, with a wine and malt or a malt only license. Exactly. Correct. That was my recommendation based on looking at other communities in the area. And it basically mirrors the wine and malt licensing in other communities. 
Okay. Very good. Thanks. I'll take a motion. I move that we approve the 2021 license and permit fee schedule for um, the alcoholic licenses. Maureen Dwinnell, aye. I uh, second the motion. Stephen Metellian, aye. Uh, Brett Simus, aye. That's unanimous. Uh, next up, we have the 2021 license renewals. Um, and so this is both the class two, um, the restaurant, uh, entertainment, and liquor licenses. Um, and I think the only, uh, beyond any questions that folks have, uh, Maureen and Steve, I think the only other comment we would have here is that when we do make a motion for these, um, that we would do it contingent on uh, payment of all application uh, related fees and costs, as well as I think, um, Sandy, you had mentioned, do they need to have the appropriate insurances in place as well? Is that part insurance of it? Insurance is Yes, insurance inspection um, as well. Mr. Chairman, I need to recuse myself for the class two license renewals. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I can step away for a few minutes. Okay. Um, this, oh, um, you moved, Fred, I'm sorry, <laughs> to the other, the other side of my screen. Um, if um, under the class two, um, there were two licensees that came in um, after, the, after the form was prepared. If you yeah. could just add MGM Auto and Upton Truck and Auto for your consideration to that class two list. Okay. All right, and then again, this is uh, contingent on payment of all, what are the word, payment of all application and associated fees as well as any inspections. Yes. Yes, okay. Okay. I don't have any questions on, on any of these. These are all, um, there's not, nothing new on here uh, from, from last year. So Maureen, I'll take a motion. I move, do we go through all of them or just as the licenses as presented, including the MGM auto and Upton truck and auto? As a right. Through all of them? I think we no, can do as for each group, is that right, Sandy? So we'll do one for the class twos, one for the restaurant, one for entertainment, one for liquor licenses. Okay. Correct. Four, four motions. I move that we approve the class two licenses um, for Italian Motors, McHugh Sales, Muzu. Automotive in, Incorporated, Patrick Davison, Precision Auto Center, Upton Foreign Auto Service, Upton Getty Incorporated, MGM Auto, and Upton Truck and Auto. And then you want to Brett? Yeah, I, 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 I second it and uh, in favor, aye, Brett Simons. Maureen Dwinnell, aye. Majority action. Great. I move that I move that we approve the common victual license for Country uh, Club Super, KCLC Incorporated, Red Rock Grill and Bar, KB Holdings, Main Street Pizza, CNN Food Service Incorporated, Honey Farms Incorporated, Kevin Lou Incorporated, SBD Incorporated, and Upton House of Pizza in the VFW. Maureen Dwinnell, I. Second the motion on um, common VIC licenses. Stephen Metellian, aye. Brett Simus, aye. Unanimous action. I move, that, oh, I move that we approve the entertainment of KCLC Incorporated, Auto Amusement, Coin Op One, Red Rock Grill and Bar, Live Music. Maureen Dwinnell, aye. Second the motion. Stephen Metellian, aye. Brett Simus, aye. Unanimous action. Okay. Um, I move that we approve the liquor licenses for the Nitmuck Rod and Gum and, and Gun Club and Rushford and Sons. Maureen Dwinnell, aye. Second the motion. Stephen Metellian, aye. 
and all of this is based on taxes being paid. Correct, use, Sandy? Use, yes. Use taxes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that? Okay. I Very did good. want to just make mention um, of the late fee charge of the hundred dollars. Does that a does that apply to common VIC licenses as well? Because I know some of those don't come in until after the first of the year. I don't know if we need they, to um, You know, and I guess the other thing I was going to make, just make general mention of is when you look at our fee schedules and then you consider a $100 late fee, it's an awful expensive late fee uh, with regard to some of the licenses. Yeah, so let's general observation. Yeah, we should talk about the the any of the fees and things like that, right? Because I think that's a that's a separate conversation. I'm not familiar with what any of the the fees are on this stuff, but um, one thing I did want to do before we move too far is officially close the poll hearing, um, <laughs> which is a, a technicality, but something that we need to do. So at uh, 7:57, I'm closing the uh, the poll hearing. Maureen Dwinell, aye. <laughs> So. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I majority I uh, second the motion. Stephen Mattelli and I. Our time is high. It's close. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I think it's probably worth making sure there's consistency in how we're uh, establishing and applying fees for any type of uh, license uh renewals or what have you so i don't know who who determines those derek is that something that that the board of selectmen determines or how do those policies get put in place yeah all fee structures and uh, fines would be approved at the board of selectmen okay perfect the, so we've got that so the, the late fee was approved in december of 2019. gotcha okay very good um Next, and Eric, is that on? That's on VIC licenses as well, or coin op licenses? That would be. Yes. On all the licensing, yes, on all the renewals. Next up, we have the uh, motion to accept the crosswinds deed. I know that was something, Steve, you wanted to take a look at. I don't know if you had specific questions uh, or if you had a chance to review it. And if 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 any questions, we'll answer them. If not, I'll take a motion. I did have a chance to review it. Uh, looks good to me. So, um, Maureen, if you have no questions, I can make a motion. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Uh, make a motion that we move to execute the uh, crosswinds deed. Stephen Mattelli and I. Second, Maureen Dwinell, aye. Brett Simus, aye, unanimous action. And next, we have the uh, motion to accept the deed for Zero Grove Street. Again, similar. This is the for folks that may not be aware. This is the parcel of land um, that was approved for purchase at this fall's town meeting. Um, any questions on that? Otherwise, I'll take the motion. No questions. Steve, you're on mute. You're on mute, Steve. <laughs> Interesting. If you had a chance to read that deed, the rods and stones and the line passes through an yeah. old oak tree. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, Maureen, did you have any questions? No, no questions for me. Okay. Uh, make a motion that we execute the deed for the Grove Street property. I believe it's listed here as Zero Grove Street. Stephen Mattelli and I. Second, Maureen Dwinell, aye. That's on this aye, unanimous action. Uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, Seth Grill talking about a um, beautification fund request that's being made on behalf of the Upton Fire and EMS Association and Upton Men's so Seth, do you want to walk us through uh, the request here, if you're here? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, Seth Grill. Um, so this request is um, on behalf of the, the both the Upton Men's Club and the Upton Fire and EMS Association. 
um, up to I don't know more than twenty five hundred or two thousand five hundred dollars for the uh, from the beautification fund um, to help light the town common uh, for the upcoming holiday season. Uh, currently, we we have purchased uh, holiday lights um, in excess of a little bit over a thousand dollars. Additionally, there's we're we're doing a fundraiser to help support the town um, to some of the town. Um, uh, um, uh, foundations and different programs that we have. Um, so we're, we're basically asking um, for donations for trees that uh, closed, I believe, yesterday. Uh, I think we we locked in about a hundred. Uh, sorry, I think we locked in about eight or nine trees um, for at a hundred dollars a tree, um, which those donations will be made throughout the town, uh, different town. Um, uh, company or different fundraiser and um, uh, different boards to include like the Bloomer Girls and stuff like that. Um, Great. So Great. Th basically, uh, this is just the the, the cost uh, we're asking for just funds to be able to for the purchase of the the lighting uh, as well as the trees to be able to do so. Uh, additionally, we've asked for. Um, um, we asked, uh, put in a request for town usage of the common on um, on um, December 6th, this upcoming Sunday, uh, for about seven at 7 p.m. for a, a tree lighting ceremony. Um, of which uh, there there might be a, a social. We're asking socially distance wearing masks at the common, uh, 7 p.m. lighting uh, with a arrival of Santa, um, and. So beyond that, that's really all I have pending any questions. No, that's that that's great. This is a it's a it's a great opportunity to to you know use the beautification funds and a, and a lot of volunteer uh, time, effort, and, and labor to not only get the lights to coordinate the the event and the fundraising um, and to put all the lights up on display. I know there were lights that you guys put up around uh, the library as well as on the town common. Um, even just, you know, everything from figuring out where the outlets are and fixing wiring uh, and doing all that. It's a lot of time, effort and energy and obviously coming before the board here and requesting the funds. Um, it, it's nice to see this happening again. I know um, Assistant Fire Chief Mike Marshan and I had talked about it, I think, over the summer about the fact that this is something that used to be done for a lot of years in town and then uh, the tradition changed over the years and stopped. But uh, I think it's a, a great year and a great opportunity to, to partner uh, and to see sort of the the town with the funds uh, and and the fire and EMS association with all the the effort and passion and, and manpower and women power along with the and men's club coming together to to make this happen. So we're looking forward to the tree lighting. Uh, I think the downtown will look great. I'm I'm certainly in favor. The process would be whenever you get receipts uh, up to but not to exceed twenty five hundred dollars. If you submit them through Sandy, uh, we'll make sure that those those get paid. Um, Maureen, Steve, uh, what questions do you have or comments? No, it's good to see this tradition start up again. And yes, I agree. Absolutely. Especially given COVID, it's nice to try to get back to normalcy and, and you know, really try to promote the holidays as, as best we can. Uh, just a quick question for you, Mr. Grom. I know you said you have a thousand dollars already purchased. I assume that you've got another order of lights um, coming in. Is this something that you're going to use these lights not on the trees that you're sponsoring, but these would be the general trees in the area of the town common, and you'd use them year after year moving forward? Uh, yes, that's correct. So um, the the trees that have been um, that are going to be sponsored. Um, we're allowing those, whether they're companies or families who have sponsored those trees or adopted a tree, as we quoted, as we said, um, we're allowing them to decorate, um, you know, whether it's solar lights, um, decorations, but we have some guidelines. I don't remember them off the top of my head. I do apologize. Uh, but the, the lighting that we have that we're purchasing is to be used on on, on the, the bushes in the front by the memorial, uh, the, the large tree on the common. Um, additionally, we haven't uh we're we're waiting to see how the lights look before we purchase more lights um for for some of the back trees in the back memorial closer to the, to the upton house of pizza side um 
but pending those are those those the lights that are currently up look uh, good from and from what I said what it sounds like assistant chief uh, Mike Marshman who did light it up really quickly just to see at night a couple last week um, the hope is that we'll also be able to add those lights um, before at some point soon as well that'd be great really great good I will take a motion you're on mute no, you're muted boring I, I move that we approve $2,500, not up to $2,500 to the Upton Men's Club and the Upton Fire EMS from the Town Beautification Fund to decorate the Town Common for the 2020 holiday season. Maureen Dwinnell, aye. Uh, second the motion, Stephen Mattelli and I. Brett Simus, aye. Unanimous action. Thank you very much, Mr. Grill, and to everyone involved. We appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just a quick follow-up. Should we make a motion to authorize the use of the town common? Was that also something that he made mention to? That's a separate. That is, yeah, that is um, a uh, reviewed by myself in conjunction with the fire. Uh, sorry, the police chief. Uh, yeah. So that's um, that doesn't go in front of the board of select. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. Um, so uh, next up, we have the uh, Upton Men's Club to talk about the uh, Ice Out Challenge. <laughs> ice Out Challenge on uh, on. Mr. Howell, welcome. Hello. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Good. Um, thank you for taking me on so quickly on the agenda. I sent in the, the notice, and uh, next thing I know, I was like pressed in the duty real fast because I was like, wow. And it was four days and I was in. Um, so You're rising thanks through for the ranks. Yeah, I don't know why I found my way in today. But anyways, um, you guys know the deal. We're uh, we're going to try this one more time. Maybe Mother Nature will cooperate this year. We'll get a little ice going because uh, last year was very difficult, to say the least. Uh, we did come up with a winner, but um, we're hoping for some thick ice and, you know, maybe we'll get some month and a half out of this thing this year. would be really nice. Um, but I just wanted to check in with you guys. I'm going to certainly apply for the um, sign for the per uh, a permit to put a sign up to advertise the event and uh, all in with our billboard that will be out on the ice with the uh, the ice out device. So I'm really thinking, uh, you know, it's a good town feel. Hopefully um, I'll be coming back to you guys if we get the ice. Uh, I was thinking we could possibly have get a permit to use Pratt Pond. Um, the beach area and, and get that uh, outdoor fire pit going and uh, maybe we'll have a little holiday chair out on the ice and uh, do other events because it's certainly a good way to distance people. I mean, if we get that thing frozen up solid and I think it'd be a good uh, town event and uh, along with the Christmas trees and everything else going on, I, I feel at least we're trying to strive through the 2020 with uh, and get to 21 fast. <laughs> <laughs> No, that, that's great. I think we're all uh, all in support of the Ice Out Challenge and, and whatever you guys uh, need from us. Is there anything um, specific, Derek, that we need to to approve? I know you, they, you know, putting up signs and things like that are there. Is there a process or um, applications that need to be had for some of those things that, that Mike mentioned? Um, just to approve the use of, of the beach area, the pond. Mm -hmm. It's public property. Okay, yeah, that, we know about the sign permit. Um, that's a that's a standard thing for us. Uh, we will reach out if if, if like I say, the, the uh, conditions exist for us to actually use that uh, beach area. Then I'm thinking that turnaround on that permit. Uh, does that have uh, selectman approval, or, or so will that be a couple of weeks? Uh, I don't think you need selectman approval to use the beach, but just as okay. long as you fill out the application, we can have the chief review it. Excellent. All right. I appreciate it. And uh, certainly when, when we get closer to going out on the ice, I, I'll reach out to the uh, the chief and the, of the fire and the chief of the police and let them know what's going on. I'm sure they're going to hear rumors going around the town that uh, we're after this again. It's, uh, it's, it's a great event. It looks like Mr. Metallion has a question, so I'll let, uh, let him ask or a comment. Yeah, just a quick question. I remember last year, I believe, or maybe it was the year before, it, 
the snowman was a little closer to the kind of Hoppington Road side. So were you thinking about setting it up closer to Kiwanis, the actual beach side now this year? Is that what you're thinking? And then I guess I was just going to say roughly timing wise, um, that's usually January through maybe March. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, right now I currently have the um, the rules in front of me and we're thinking all hopefulness will we launch this before January 1st and the actual ticket sales go to February 15th. So that puts a little pressure on the ticket sales, but that way we're not people aren't coming up to the last minute and saying, hey, you know what, today is the day because it's 65 out and the ice has got to be an inch thick. Um, so we're trying to put a cutoff date on the ticket sales to hopefully um, that will improve our sales and, and people won't be just hanging out to the very last minute and then putting in a, um, a bid. But um, as far as the frosty location, we're actually going to stay in the same location. I was just saying if, if the ice is thick enough and we can walk from the ice across to the beach, then it certainly makes for a great atmosphere for social distancing. You know, that would be a great out, great outdoor venue and event. We I don't think we've really done a, a winter event outdoors um, before, whether it's be an, an ice fishing derby or any type of uh, winter fun out there. So that would be uh, an interesting thing if we could start a start a new tradition. If it uh, if it works out, that would be pretty cool. So. Yeah, we're just relying on uh, Mother Nature and hopefully we'll get some ice fishing. Steve, having been part of this for the past several years with the men's club, I, ch I chuckle because, like, man, is the ice an unpredictable thing around here. It's like <laughs> 18 inches thick or gone in a matter of three or four days. So it was 60 degrees out today, so we're not putting Frosty out this week. <laughs> no. Nope. Right. And I, and I hate to, I hate to get long-winded with some of my, uh, my musings, but back when I was a kid, that pond would freeze solid. And usually they'd get a nice auger and they'd dig it and they'd see how thick it was. And they actually would have, I forget who promoted it. I want to say it was the local church promoted it, but they would have a winter event on the ice. And it would be packed. I mean, there would be literally four or 500 people out on the ice. Everything yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, the winter festivals. People would be, uh, yeah, like a winter festival. Uh, maybe on the you know very far end over by river, people would be you know, even ice fishing. Uh, they'd be cook, cooking hot dogs and things of that nature. So it was a big, it was kind of a big deal when I was a kid. You definitely looked forward to it. Um, I'm right. not sure if, if, like you say, Mother Nature, I don't know if it'll cooperate, but I imagine one of these years will be okay. Yeah. So All right. I certainly wish you good luck. It's a, it's a great idea. So we'll, thank you. We'll, yeah. we'll be there. Let us know if you guys need anything, Mike. I will. I just, I'm just want to make sure that you guys are aware as town officials and, you know, it, you'll know the day it's up. We yeah, we'll spread, we'll spread the word too. It's good to uh, get out here, and we'll make sure that uh, we spread the word and get folks. I'll busy. be on. And, and in my final closing, I'll be honest. I, I printed out a bunch of the tickets because I don't know why in my brain I was actually going to see you guys tonight, and I was going to hand them to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for taking me on, uh, taking me in the agenda, and I appreciate it. And you guys have a happy holiday. Hey, yeah, you, you know, I wouldn't be paying you for my ticket till I was sure there was ice. <laughs> Keep it, so you know, I don't want to prepay too early. Exactly. There you go. That, 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 in all seriousness, people can go on the, is the men's club website. Is Are there tickets on there yet or they'll look there no. later? Currently, we, we, have, we don't have that operational just yet. We're, we're just seeking town approval. And I'm going to the board of directors meeting right after this to uh, make sure I get the seed money to... Uh, start the whole process so it, it kind of like i said i wasn't anticipating being this close to being with you guys when but we, hey i really appreciate everything and you guys taking the time uh certainly I, and i'll be honest it was good for me to sit down in one of these meetings as a town person and, and listen to all the stuff that you guys did tonight and thanks for all your work happy holidays happy we appreciate holidays. it very much mike happy, happy holidays, holidays you as well thanks thanks mike yep. bye bye should we uh, should we motion the use of the beach, Derek? Did you say we should authorize use? So we, should we make a motion on that? You thinking? It's it doesn't need to come through the board. Yeah, no, the, he, Mike would have to fill out just an application, and I put that in front of the chief just so they're both aware of it. Okay. Very good. All right. See you, Mike. Thanks. See ya. All right. Nice work, folks. Last uh, we have on here is the.
Town hall use policy. So review and amend the use of the Upton Town Hall policy. So Maureen, this came up, I think, last maybe January or February. I, I, I for be pre-pandemic, I think, and it was out there and it was on our list that we went through in July. So I thought I would just put it on the agenda so we could uh, have the conversation and try to check one more thing off the list. Um, I know there was, uh, in reading through it, there were some inconsistencies and um, certainly some changes that, that I would recommend. Steve, I don't know if you've gone through it. Um, a couple of the things that I saw um, that I would, I would want to have a conversation about a potentially amendment from my perspective. One is um, the idea that whoever would be using the town hall, that it would be limited to uh, nonprofits, um, or I think it says some other type of organization. I think it should be a venue that could be leveraged by anyone in town. Um, you know, as a as a private entertainment venue, I think it's a it's a beautiful facility. Uh, it's in the heart of the town. Um, it, it represents part of what we're trying to do in terms of revitalizing the town center is to get people down there, to get people involved. And I think of people that, you know, in terms of supporting local businesses, right, if the brewery um, wants to have an event or they want to get people together or do tours or what have you, there's the more that's going on with the community center, with the potential redevelopment, with the brewery, with other businesses coming downtown. The more that we can offer that that space up as something that can be used to promote uh, gathering, promote business, promote promote socialization, socialization amongst folks in town, I think is great. Um, so I would like to see that that change to to be opened up a little bit, which is uh, number two on the in the policy. Um, there's also uh, a note in there that the the hours I think can't or, or the events need to conclude by. 11 o'clock and I would say that we would want to add an exception to that um, by the town manager so sort of that would be the standard but if um, uh, if approved by the town manager that those hours could be uh, changed there's also an uh, item G in there that talks about food preparation and consumption in the main hall um, again I think that allowing food certainly consumption there's a kitchen downstairs where people can do food prep but again, I think that the more we can do to invite people to utilize the facility um, as sort of the crowning jewel of the town and the, the $10 million, $8 million investment people made in renovating it, I think would be great. Um, item E to be updated. And again, I can share these all with you, Sandy, specifically. So don't write them down now, but just uh, there's some update that needs to happen. I think Blythe's uh, email address is in there as a contact email address. And then, um, Item I, it says that you can't have balloons in the main room. I assume that's because they'll float up to the ceiling. So um, we'll leave that one. But that was it. Those were just some of my initial initial thoughts and comments. I think everything else in here about, you know, requiring the liquor license and the Board of Health for the food service and all the, the supplemental insurance and all that, like obviously the, the number one thing is to protect the town from any liability. And I think that the policy does that, having experienced it firsthand. Um, there was a lot of coverage, and I think that that's a that's a good thing. Um, so those were my those were my comments. I don't know, Steve, if you had uh, comments or, or proposed changes or reaction to any of that, or Maureen, from your perspective, what you're thinking. Yeah, uh, actually, I had I did have some time. I really read through it fairly thoroughly. I made some notes, picked up on a few things, just as you mentioned, two uh, B and two E uh, both have the previous town manager's uh, email address. So of course we'd want to correct that. Um, I also picked up on the no balloons. I mean, see, I'm looking at it thinking, I don't know exactly the again the way it's crafted. It would dissuade things like uh, maybe a shower or a kid's birthday party or something like that. But I guess you have to kind of figure out who you're actually, you know, trying to invite and who you're, you know, trying to. Um, I guess, you know, say weed out. I don't know if that's a fair way to say it. Um, so balloons is something that popped up, thinking if you were gonna have that type of an event, you'd wanna include balloons. But um, also under clause 10 parking, I thought we need to expand that a little bit because it's basically calling, uh, you know, we've increased the parking at Town Hall on Warren Street and we've it doesn't make any mention of the municipal parking lot 
right across from the Rustine building. So I thought that should be cleaned up and kind of expanded upon. So I saw clause, again, clause 10. Um, on the schedule of fees, athletic leagues, there was no mention in there of a fee. So I'm thinking a lot of them were, you know, no fee. So I was thinking that should be something, again, just clean it up, kind of a, uh, a just a quick edit there. Um, you know, and then at the bottom where it made mention of other fees that you may have to incur, say, for instance, um, trash fee or uh, custodial fee or something. I thought that may be a good place to plug in what a detail officer may cost or also if there's a fire department uh, official necessary, what those costs would be. Just to kind of have it all in one, you know, one document. Um, so, again, those were some things that kind of jumped out. You know, and I and I guess then you come full circle and, and you think about the alcohol use, you know, is that, again, I guess, what are we, I look at the events I've been to at Town Hall most recently, I think would have been the Air Force Band. I think the Cultural Council put that on. Uh, thought that was a great venue for a really nice event. Uh, prior to that, uh, a fundraiser um, that, that you hosted and a retirement party before that. I know even five, 10 years back, typically police officers or police chiefs, when they would retire, they would usually have a ceremony at town hall. So those are the type of events really that I've been to there other than, I don't even know, things back when I was a kid probably. So, you know, I guess that's, you know, that's something really subject to debate. You know, do we want to, you know, exclude alcohol, include alcohol? What, you know, what's the, what's the purview of the board at this point in time it certainly is something that future boards can you know vacillate back and forth on but you know today what do you know what are we thinking today and i guess i'll just leave that okay you morning. That for you, well, I, I agree with steve on the alcohol part of it um i don't think there should be alcohol served in any public buildings um, uh, I would be willing to uh, vote on doing away with that. And if you're going to change, uh, you are you thinking of changing number two, Brett? Yeah, I would basically eliminate number two and uh, just open it up. I don't know why we would have any restriction on who could utilize a, a public facility. Um, you know, obviously, we still control the, the use. It's not as though uh, people could just have unfettered access to it. Um, but restricting it to, to nonprofits, I don't know what that, I don't know why we wouldn't want to encourage people to use the facility for other private events, whether it's a, a brewery, a local small business, mm -hmm. uh, a, a different, uh, you know, social group that might want to get together. Yeah. I mean, anything, uh, even birthday parties or kids' birthdays or, grandparents' birthdays or retirement parties, uh, to me, the more use we can get in that building, the better. And, you know, I'm certainly a fan of, uh, you know, awarding liquor licenses to uh, folks that would want to use the facility. Um, you know, I don't know, again, why we why we wouldn't do that. I don't have, you know, there's obviously the town's not going to take on any undue liability. That goes without saying. So other than some philosophical um, uh, disagreement with the notion of fundamentally having alcohol on town property. I don't know why we would do that. We certainly can protect ourselves from a liability perspective by requiring insurance. Um, anybody that would be serving alcohol comes with their own insurance. And in addition, uh, the requirement is for event insurance on top of that. So, you know, there's like three or four levels of insurance. So from a legal perspective where there's certainly not any risk, um, but you know that's that's obviously just just my view. I think it's been that way for um, at least as long as Steve can remember, and he remembers a lot longer than I do. At least in regards to Upton, I'm not saying other things, Steve. Just in Upton, <laughs> your memory goes far. You're picking on my back. advancing age. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so so you know, obviously, I I I don't think that we should uh, stop people from having alcohol, and I do think we should eliminate that number two, Maureen, so that we would open it up to to anybody that is willing to pay us. Well, I don't. I'm, I don't care whether they have alcohol or not. I just don't think it uh, sets a good example for a public building or a government building to be serving alcohol. Like the White House. 
I don't care who does it, whether state, it's the White state, House or anybody else. State state dinners, meetings. I mean, it's fine. I, we we can agree to disagree. That's fine. Steve. Getting, getting back to number two now, are you talking at the very top under policy number two or when you go down to, let's just say, chapter two or category two permitting requirements? Uh, the very the very top. Policy. The one that, yeah, the, the top. The very top. The very top. Yeah, because that just talks about, right, the, the right? Religious organization what, for non-religious yeah. purchases, uh, right. purposes, I should say. Right. I don't know why would we, we would restrict it, I guess would be my notion, but somebody commercial thought, activities though. Should should we be promoting commercial activities in the town hall? Go ahead, Derek. I, I don't know what you mean by commercial, but go ahead, Derek. It's <clears throat> on number two. Uh, I mean, I, I would just, think the commercial activities take for instance uh, the the school does uh, a vendor fair. Or something like that. You know, I, I don't see that that space would ever be used for that, but I guess there's something we need to discuss. If somebody wanted to do a vendor fair at Town Hall, you know, to promote business, would that be a commercial activity? Now, how would you interpret that? I, I don't know. I, so I guess I was less focused on the commercial activity and more the private use. So um, I mean, I don't have a problem with the private this, use. Okay, yeah, so that I, that's really all I'm saying, right? I guess I was looking at the, you know, you can't have parties, you can't have recitals, receptions, or other private uses, and I think you should be able to have it for private uses. I don't even know what commercial activity means, but certainly I don't, I don't know that we would want to have any commercial activity in there. So I, I, if that was confusing, that's my fault. I really just meant the private use. Hey, hey Brett, can I, can I just... Just add something just, here. Yeah, in a second, Steve. Thanks. Yeah. So, Maureen, do you have? Does that make sense? Does that? What? Well, I guess maybe Dave, Derek, do you know what commercial activity would mean in this context? I don't know what it would mean. <clears throat> um, I, I would only think that it's maybe so for some for-profit venture. Um, um, you know, maybe it's like a flower show. They want to sell flowers and they make a profit off of that's the only thing I could think of yeah. um, but one thing one thing I did want to bring up is that uh, whatever the board decides under this section that you, that you are, are discussing um, I wanted it to be known that uh, although in section two it says this is not for private use if you go all the way down to the bottom of the document under use fees there is a fee for private use so we have a direct conflict with the language that's in that paragraph versus the actual um, user fees, which allows for private. So yeah. in any case, we have to eliminate, we have to clean that up. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The, the fee there for private events, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I would say, you know, making it consistent, certainly I don't, I don't care about commercial uses. I don't, I don't know what that means, but certainly it doesn't sound like we would need them. Um, my thing was strictly the private events, so. You know, and I think there's something else we may want to do there um, to kind of take the ownership on ourselves as you read through the document. It's another something that kind of jumped out at me. If you think town-wide what we do is as a BOS, a lot of things come before us from, you know, road racing events to uh, town hall, uh, town common. We had a couple of requests uh, early part of this year for use of the town common um signage anything posted on town property it always comes before the board obviously poll hearings um it, it, myriad of other issues come before us so if there's something like this that it's town property that we're going to authorize a use for i think really that should come before the bos and it allow us to make judgment calls on those so let's again let's go back in time um you presented to the board when when you requested use of the uh, the uh, town hall. I believe before that, I, I believe that came before the board the board of selectmen as well. So I just think some of the language in this does not make mention of the board of selectmen having authority over its use. So it says you know it, it says really it's authorized by the town manager. Mm -hmm. 
I think there it should say authorized by and throughout the document, again, just to kind of tie up some of those loose ends, um, put in there authorized by the Board of Selectmen. And, you know, we could write or, you know, you could rephrase it, Board of Selectmen designee, Board of Selectmen town manager. But, you know, if we've got the past practice of everything coming before the Board of Selectmen, I think we'd want to make sure that we continue to do it in that fashion. I don't see any reason why we would change that. I think the only reason that came up was because of the the one day liquor license. So I think the 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 only reason and again, I, I'm fine. With, I, I'm very comfortable with delegating this to um, to the town manager. If we yeah. want to say, you know, the board of selectmen or a designate parentheses, for example, the town manager, that's fine. But I certainly don't want. You know, if the local soccer team wants to have a practice at the town hall, I don't want them to have to come to a board of selectmen meeting. So I think that you know we should just make sure it's it's as user friendly as possible. I guess is my point. We want to have control so that things don't get out of hand or something totally wild doesn't go on, but we also want to make it as easy as possible and encourage people to to use the facility. I agree. I just wouldn't want to have a situation where there was an event held at town hall and really the board may not even know about it so that would be the only thing that the only caveat i would say we'd want to make sure what, what kind what kind of event though right like did you know that the the jump roping team goes there on thursday nights i mean <laughs> right like so there's some there's some line where i don't want to know <laughs> right mm -hmm. like I, I trust town hall staff to manage yeah. the facility as needed i don't need to be involved with every, everything but to the point so i guess define or clarify what it is you'd want to make sure didn't happen without us knowing about it and let's be specific well no i mean certainly you know basketball has been going on there you know since before i was a kid so i wouldn't expect those things to require a, a bos um meeting and presentation and all that good thing you know and, and obviously security fee and all those things i think that would be you know pushing it you know way out of bounds uh, but I think any other use of the hall, any meeting space use of the hall, I would think would require us to kind of sign off on that, or at least ask the appropriate questions. I would think. You know, because think about it, somebody then could come and use the town hall. Again, we don't really, I guess we'd say we don't really have any authority over it. But if somebody wants to come and use the town common, they do need to come and see us, right? So in other words, I see that they, as an inconsistency. But they don't. They they don't need to come see us. They need to go through the town manager and follow the policy that's in place for town hall use for town common usage. We don't need to get involved with town common usage. Yes, we do. We approve two town common usage for the both of the rallies that were held in the spring. So again, I'm just looking for consistency. And, and I'm just thinking that's something that we need to think about. You know, we had, they were agenda items. We discussed them. People came, presented to us. And that was a problem with a previous board. I, I remember a distinct story. I won't retell it and bore you with the details, but uh, that's been that way forever. So I see that as an inconsistency. Why should somebody be able to come? And again, they can skip rope at town hall. We're not going to give anybody a hard time for skipping rope. But why would you request, why should somebody have to request use of the town common? but not have to request use of the town hall. I don't know, Derek, you, that is was, there, it, I mean, was it actually a request for, you, for the Board of Selectmen to vote on, or was it an informational hearing because of what was going on with all the ra rallies? Oh, no, they were definitely, I, I believe I was chairman at the time. Those were definitely agenda items, and we definitely motioned. I, I can't remember the dates. There was two different. Uh, events that were held but um those were definitely motion voted and approved by the bos so again okay. I, you know i just think we should be consistent and i think we should keep that under our jurisdiction yeah that's great i i agree i think that's fine i don't think we should make it overly burdensome to people if someone wants a liquor license they've got to come before us so um you know i don't i don't again no what are you showing us here derek the application. Uh, this is the town common uh, use application that's online um, that we ask all of the applicants who want to use town common to to fill out. And you see, it has the uh, chief's signature, uh, public safety purposes, and then ultimately 
uh, my signature as well. Yeah. So I, I think, think, you know, I think there is inconsistencies to, to Steve's point. Um, you know, there are def there are certainly some things that I personally would not feel comfortable signing off on, um, like a uh, protest or a peaceful protest that would that happened this past summer. Yeah, that's probably something that should go in front of the board of selectmen, uh, and I think that's probably why um, we brought you know we decided to bring that in, in front of you. I do have to say that there are some things that if I feel like I, I need to bring in front of the board, um, even though the town manager through the town manager may have a, the authority to sign off on, um, I, I'll take advantage of that to make sure that um, anything that it gets approved, we try to have as much transparency as possible. And that's why I bring some of these items in front of the board. Mm -hmm. So we can look, so I, I agree, Steve, we should eliminate the, any inconsistencies across the policies. I think, you know, ultimately to your point, if there's something very significant that's gonna go on at town hall, uh, I don't want us to feel like we don't have the ability to maintain, for lack of a better word, jurisdiction over what's going on at the town hall. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. So it's just, again, it, uh, it's for me, it's the balance between making sure we have that ultimate authority but also that we're not creating any undue burden to people that are trying or dissuading people from using a facility that they pay taxes on um, and that's available and it's a beautiful facility. So I guess that's, that's my only, that's the only, that's the only balance I'm trying to strike. I, I couldn't agree more that we need the ultimate sort of authority and control to make sure that people can't just have unfettered access. We just need to make it easy. So I agree with you. Are there changes, Derek, that you see in here, or do we need to go through this and, and sort of come up with our own specific changes, or do you guys want to take a shot at this? I, I do, I, we do need to close the, uh, I think we can close the discussion on alcohol use in terms of just making a decision here with the three of us. So Steve, that's probably going to be on you. The other thing that I mentioned that, that I would ask that people incorporate, which I think we've got agreement on, is the private uses and just making that consistent to allow for private uses. And then the third thing is the hours for the events um, and giving the town manager discretion to extend those hours uh, you know, with whatever approval, whether it's board approval or something else. So I think those were the, those were the three items. Um, are you guys good with the, giving the town manager slash us the authority to make exceptions to the hours? Hey, hey Brett, can I just mention one thing? No, no, nope, not right now, Steve. Not right now. Thank you. Um, so, are you guys good with with that one? Yeah, yes. I think I think we could have certainly have some latitude there. You know, there's things that are time sensitive. Something runs late, and you know they're late getting to town hall. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. All right. So that's one. And then um, in terms of the the support for private events is that are you guys okay with private events again as long as they go through all the other requirements and insurances and licenses and permits and all that so you'd have to change the language on that one yeah to allow it yeah exactly yeah to, to align it with the, the fee schedule because at the bottom it does have a fee for private events correct um, so it's just making sure that there's consistency but yes exactly so are you guys okay with that one yes Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I guess the question is, what are you thinking about the commercial activity? Do we leave that in as a no? I wouldn't want to see commercial activity. Yeah, I honestly don't know what it is, but if you gave me an example, I would probably say no, <laughs> that I wouldn't want it. So. Well, it leaves it open to anybody. To It leaves it open to anybody, anybody from out of town. I don't have a problem with taxpayers using the buildings or the, or the town property, but not yeah. for profit organizations to come in and use it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, totally I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. agree with that. So we should leave that in. Let's leave it. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right, Steve. What are, what's your thoughts on the on the alcohol? I know you kind of can go either way. No, no, so. no. no. Oh, sorry. I'm talking to Mr. Metellian. Thanks, Mr. Byrne. Um, yeah, I think I've said it in the past. I I kind of could go either way on this. Um, 
residents that have spoken to me really are not in favor of it. Mm -hmm. um, somebody brought up the, I understand, you know, we've got a lot of insurance and, and we have, you know, we've kind of indemnified ourselves as best that we can. Um, I, I just think it's a, it's a tough call because that's our, that's our point of business. That's our point of contact. You know, our, I, I think if, if for instance, we had open space at the Ristine building and we were talking about the Ristine building, I think I would have a totally different feeling about this. I'd feel much more confident saying, um, yeah, I don't really see any issue at all uh, allowing alcoholic beverages. But where it's under the same roof in the same building, you know, as our licensing staff, town clerk's offices, uh, and of course, board of selectmen, town manager, executive assistant. It's a little bit, for me, it's a little bit sticky and, and residents have expressed to me that they don't like it. So I guess, you know, if I flipped a coin, obviously it can't land on the edge. If I were to flip a coin, I guess I would lean towards no, no. Uh, that that kind of would be my, you know, my rough, my rough thinking. Again, I think if, if we were talking about the Ristine building, and we had, you know, let's say fast forward and we have an opportunity to do something with that building. Um, you know, I wouldn't have no problem. I have much, much less of a problem. Again, and, it's a, and help me understand the, the, the concern. I, it, so it's not, it's not monetary. So I get that. So is it the optics of people celebrating and or having a toast for someone's retirement or a police chief retiring? Like I put it, yes, what, I think that's really it. I think that's yeah. the best way to put it. It's really the optics of you being that's that's your point of contact for everything that your town is. Mm -hmm. Any town business, anything that that people come into your your municipality, to pay a bill to apply for a license, anything. That's the one building where everything is all inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, obviously Maureen's pretty staunch. She's got. You know, she's 100 percent. This should be a no. You know, I see both sides of the argument, but I just feel that, again, that's that's your building. That's your point of contact. It, you know, should alcoholic beverages be in there? You know, are we in some way as good of an insurance as we require? Are, or could we be liable if there was a problem? I mean, it, so there's, I don't there's have that answer. There, there, well, there's that's an answer you can get. <laughs> So that's my point is like we, we should make fact based decisions. Right. So we can check with a lawyer <laughs> to get an answer to that question. So I, I, I think we can put that one to the side because we can get an answer to it if that's people's concern. The optics question, you know, I, I understand when you're focused just on the alcohol. Right. Like that seems like, well, alcohol. I don't know why there's a negative connotation associated with alcohol. Um, I don't personally drink alcohol, but I know that it's a. Uh, it's a very acceptable, appropriate, and and uh, very, uh, for lack of a better word, universally accepted social norm that when you have a celebration, um, that that people have a toast or have a drink or two. So I don't, you know, certainly there's there is when you focus on alcohol and a yes or a no. But the fact is, if people are hosting private events, they're probably going to want people to be able to have a glass of wine, right? So. Again, I think it's that notion of not creating an undue burden. Like, do we want people to use the facility or not? If we don't want people to use the facility for private events, that's okay. But let's not say we want you to have private events, but you can't have alcohol. Because essentially, for any event I've ever been to other than a kid's birthday, and, and actually even at most kids' birthday parties, if someone's paying money to have an event at a venue, they're probably serving alcohol of some sort. So that's, that's you know. That's and my, that's my, my right. answer to that would be if they wanted to serve alcohol, they could rent a hall somewhere that where you could do it. I mean, this is town government. This is our government building. And I don't think it sets a good example to the citizens to allow alcohol in the building or on any pub, uh, public property. That's that's fine. I yeah, I I. I, I disagree. I don't think it's, I think we're stigmatizing something that doesn't need to be stigmatized. Um, but that's, that's my, my two cents. So. 
Um, okay, so Steve, if you're if you're where you are, then I guess we would just have to you know update create an updated version of this policy um, and uh, take another look at it when it's all updated to reflect those uh, suggestions. Yeah, I mean, there's some things we can we can work offline and kind of clean up some of this um, and revisit it, you know, perhaps at the next meeting. Okay, very yeah. good. Yeah, and then I guess what Maureen just said, you know, triggers another thought: is are there any other town properties where you can acquire a one-day liquor license? Like, could you get a one-day liquor license at Kiwanis Beach? I wonder. I mean, I yeah, think I that's, a, how, that's, a whole lot, that's a whole other conversation we should put on in another agenda. Yeah. Let me strike that from the record. All right. Uh, let's see. Any other uh, input on this one, guys? No. Okay. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the town uh, meeting warrant to open the warrant. For December 1st, 2020, and close it on January 29th, 2021. Questions about that, Maureen and Steve Metellian? Um, are we going to ask the departments to get a, a list of their capital together for this annual town meeting? I guess that would be you, Derek. Uh, well, we had our um, five monthly staff meeting today. And um, at that meeting, we talked a little bit about our FY22 budget preparations. I did inform the staff that um, the warrant would be open today and that uh, we would accept any capital requests um, during that two month period from December 1st to January 29th. And then at that time, you know, as always, the Board of Selectmen will take those requests under consideration and we will see which which one of these capital requests make to town meeting. Okay. So that'll be all part of the annual warrant, right? That's right. Okay. And Derek, how do these dates fall in line with last year? Obviously, we ended up six weeks behind schedule on our annual town meeting. Um, it's maybe I'm just. Uh, Maybe I'm off a little bit, but this seems like we're a little earlier than last year. Or is this about the right time frame as last year? Um, we're probably within the same time frame. We may be a week off. Um, you know, I vaguely remember we may have closed uh, the first Friday in February, uh, but we may have opened uh, a little bit later. Uh, this, again, gives us eight weeks for the one to be open. Um, as you recall, I uh, issued a uh, budget calendar back in June, which um, outlines um, all the necessary uh, deadlines from the when the town meetings will take place to when the warrant will be open and closed. So all of our boards and committees have had this schedule since June that the schedule takes us all the way through uh, the annual town meeting. Okay, other questions? If not, I'll take a motion. I move that we open the annual town meeting warrant um, December 1st, 2020, and close the warrant on January 29th, 2021. Maureen Dwinell, aye. Second the motion, Stephen Metellian, aye. Brett Simus, aye. Unanimous action. Do we have any recognition? Um, Brett, are we going to approve the minutes from the October 20th and November 10th and 17th? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. You want to, why don't we do that now? Go ahead. Okay. Every, you, uh, you have, just one, one minute, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I'm, I'm good with the meeting minutes just before you motion it, Maureen. I just uh, wanted to. I'm good with the first two dates. I just thought that we should add a little extra dialogue. We had a conversation regarding the cemetery locations and properties. So I think that those particular minutes, um, I'd like to just expand on what we talked about a little bit more. So again, I'm good with October 20th and November 10th. Um, I'd just like to uh, work on the 17th a little bit. 
Um, and on line, Sandy, on line 235, Maureen makes a motion and Maureen seconds the same motion. So I think we just need to fix that. Other than that, um, everything looked good. That was on the 10th, uh, sorry, the 20th, October okay. 20th. Are you able to accept the minutes and discuss the November 17th and revisit that, or do you want to? I think we want to approve the, the 17th out. out. Approve the 20th and the 10th, leave the 17th out. We'll do that next time. Okay. Yeah, we could do that if you want to keep it quick. I mean, really, the only thing was uh, we had talked about the other parcel, the other cemetery, so I thought we might want to talk about that a little bit in the minutes. So for now, I guess if you want, I will motion. Uh, make a motion that we approve the meeting minutes from October 20th, subject to line 235, and November 10th. Stephen Metellian, aye. Second, Maureen Dwinnell, aye. Brett Simus, aye. Unanimous action. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, any other uh, or any recognition that folks have? Okay, Derek, do you want to walk us through your report? Okay, um, so um, a couple of things I'd like to bring up this evening. Uh, as I mentioned in the last meeting, Fowler, the Fowler Street Bridge was uh, nearing completion. Uh, so as of yesterday, the Fowler Street Bridge is officially reopened. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I had mentioned at the last meeting is that they would not be able to finish the final um, asphalt top uh, because we were you know, headed towards uh, the winter months. Uh, that being said, though, they were able to complete that. They felt the engineers felt very confident that the final top would adhere and they wouldn't have any problems. Uh, we do have a one-year warranty, so it, you know we did have a problem over this winter. Um, the the um, the construction firm would have to come back and uh, make any necessary repairs. Um, that being said, the only item that still is outstanding on the Fowler Street Bridge uh, project is the wetlands replication. So um, that final phase of the project will take place this coming spring. They didn't want to do the wetlands replication now because they knew, uh, they believe many of the plant species um, uh, would not survive uh, such a, a late planting uh, season. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, December 9th, the Disability Commission will be kicking off their self-evaluation and transition plan. Uh, there's going to be a meeting that we invited um, all of our department heads and our uh, boards and committees to send one representative um, to meet with uh, the Disability Commission and CMRPC, who is the consultant that's going to be assisting us with the self-evaluation uh, to attend this meeting to go over um, uh, their process uh, so, and then allow all our different boards and committees to provide input into that process. So we are looking forward to, um, to the final outcome of this long-awaited transition plan. Um, you may notice that the phase one TIP project is uh, nearing the completion. Uh, they are now winterizing uh, this aspect of the phase one project. Uh, they do, they will re-begin uh, this this phase uh, in early spring. Uh, they expect that phase one of the TIP will be completed sometime in July, uh, but that will not stop the phase two start, which they expect to also begin sometime in early to late spring, which will be taking place concurrently with the final uh, pieces of uh, phase one. So again, we're still on a probably a two, two and a half year window to complete all of the uh, of that uh, of that tip project so looking forward to that completion as well um, i'm happy to report that um, the coa they distributed over 66 mails um, those thanksgiving mails folks had to sign up in advance if they wanted a free thanksgiving mail uh, and the coa again had 66 mails that were distributed so uh, a very successful um, <clears throat> uh, program that was administered even in the midst of this pandemic in addition to that the COA has also provided 36 names to the Bloomer Girls. Uh, those individuals would receive holiday gifts uh, provided by the Bloomer Girls. Um, additionally, working with uh, Janice and, and her team, 
as we head towards this holiday season, uh, we are going to put in an insert in the town crier uh, at one of the next um, editions uh, that will outline all the different programs and services that not only the senior center has to offer, but the now running uh, seven month uh, neighbor to neighbor program that was put together by um, the Board of Selectmen uh, to help those individuals that uh, were in, in some type of need uh, due to COVID-19. So this insert's gonna, again, provide more information to the public um, so that they can get connected to any types of social services that they uh, need assistance on. Um, I'm also happy to report that there will be a press release, uh, one went out today working with Senator Moore's office and Representative Meridian, who really did uh, yeoman's work in helping us uh, get the $15,000 IT grant. So Kelly McElrath, um, who also leads our IT um, phases of, uh, of town business, uh, worked with um, Retrofit to submit the grant. Uh, this $15,000 IT grant is going to provide a redundant server up at the fire station. So it does two things. It one, it replaces the um, the outdated server that was at the fire station, but it also provides redundant services uh, to the server located at Town Hall. So uh, really excited to uh, to bring that plant to uh, to town business. Uh, if not, we would to have we would have applied for an article at uh, this annual town meeting to replace that service. So this will save us certainly some free cash dollars as we head into FY22. Additionally, uh, I think I had reported in the past, again, another press release will go out uh, for the $32,000 grant that uh, Chief Bradley spoke of last time um, to upgrade the body cam system that we have here uh, with the police about it. And then last, um, the, uh, Maya, who is our insurance provider, has uh, provided a $5,000 grant, which is going to uh, bring two Pelotons uh, to the police station. These are for, uh, for, for the police department's use primarily, but certainly if uh, other town employees had a use, we have to work with the chief to gain access to that. So uh, Sandy had taken the lead on that grant, was able to uh, work with Maya to bring, again, two Pelotons to provide some health and uh, fitness programs to um, our police force. Um, speaking of COVID-19, uh, we are now a red community. Unfortunately, we have uh, 21 active cases to date. Uh, we've had over 102 cases uh, since um, COVID-19 uh, began in uh, mid-March. Um, so working very closely with our Board of Health on potential restrictions, new restrictions um, with the Mass Department of Public Health, if those do come forward, um, the library, Trustees have recently voted to close um, the library. They will continue to offer uh, curbside services as they had prior to reopening. Uh, but given the fact that um, uh, we have sustained community transmission in our community, they thought it was best to close the doors. Town Hall, DPW, CUA, uh, we continue to keep our doors closed. We continue to offer um, uh, services uh, via the web portal. Uh, or through appointments. Um, the code department reported today that um, they are already 30, they have already have 33 more building permits pulled uh, as of December 1st, 2020 than all of 2019. So in spite of COVID, uh, building construction continues to outpace uh, what it did in 2019. And because of the online program that we have now to pull building permits, um, it's already proven itself extremely effective with just managing the workload and the volume that has taken place during this construction season. Um, uh, just uh, as an aside, more information will come forward. You may see in the news in the next couple of days that there's the police reform bill that Governor Baker is going to be taking up. Uh, uh, Chief Bradley, uh, as you all know, is um, sits on the executive board for the Mass Chiefs Association. In fact, he'll be the president of the Mass Chiefs Association next year. Uh, he's working very closely um, with that body to help inform what this uh, police reform bill ultimately will look like and be adopted uh, by the governor. So there'll be more to come on that. Uh, a number of changes uh, they do expect to come forward. 
Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to say this tonight, and you probably hear me say it over the next couple of meetings. Uh, when the Treasure Collector's Office this year issues its real estate uh, tax bills, that those will go up by December 31st. What folks uh, will notice differently this year is that instead of sending your payment into Town Hall directly to One Main Street at the Treasure Collector's Office, uh, individuals would be asked to send their payments to Century Bank with a PO box in Reading, Mass. Uh, that is a lockbox program. Um, Selectman Donnell is probably familiar with this program. This program is going to create a more efficient um, treasure collector's office uh, because Century Bank will handle these payments on behalf of the treasure collector's office and they would make the necessary deposit, uh, deposits as well uh, and then provide, uh, I, I believe, daily updates to those deposits so that we would then be able to uh, rectify our books. So what this does, it takes away the need to have additional staff just handle our our daily deposits. So again, looking for additional ways to make the office more efficient uh, by streamlining some of uh, those operations. So uh, it was presented this morning at our staff meeting, but I wanted to bring it up today. Uh, certainly we'll bring it up at our, uh, our next meeting just to remind folks. Uh, and then as we get closer to the release of our real estate tax bills, we will uh, be putting notices uh, certainly in the tax bill of what this means, uh, but you know, through our normal communication measures such as social media, uh, the websites, and the and beyond. Uh, pending any questions, I'll turn this back over to the chair. That's great, Derek. Thank you. A um, lot going on as always, so good stuff. Uh, any questions, Steve or Maureen? None for me. I guess I did have a question. Does does that mean that I thought our banking relationship was always with Unibank? Does that mean that now residents can't make any payments at the office? And would the banking relationship change then to a different bank? Uh, no, we still we still do all of our primarily banking through Unibank. Century is going to handle the lockbox system on our behalf and then make those deposits again on our behalf. Um, but to your question, certainly if individuals wanted to come to Town Hall and drop off a payment in our currently outside in our box treasure collector's box uh, we would we would continue to make those deposits uh, but many of the of the payments uh, are made either you know through escrow through your mortgage or are just sent in via regular mail so these ones that are sent in regular mail would go directly to um, the PR box and ready yeah, I know there's an ePay system now that we've been using at, in my household. Um, it's been working pretty well, actually. And then uh, the other question I had for you, you made mention of the um, the senior center and the meals uh, that they delivered. Uh, is the senior center open for any gatherings at all, or are they closed as well? The senior center has stayed closed since, uh, since day one, uh, as you know. Uh, the population that would typically go to the senior center are certainly our highest risk category uh, as it relates to COVID. Um, so like most other senior centers across the state, we've stayed closed, uh, have provided uh, social and support services uh, either through a go-to meeting, uh, through live chats, uh, or through telephone conference calls. Uh, but all the services that we've always provided uh, have been taking place, uh, such like fuel assistance, uh, food assistance. Um, the the uh, food pantry is open if, if individuals uh, uh, needed support in that uh, respect. Uh, really, the only thing I think we've lost through the senior center is the daily programming, and um, uh, that's not to be forgotten because you know many of our seniors really have become socially isolated. Uh, during this period of time, and and so Janice has done a lot and the best that she can to um, to reach out to those individuals. She really has a running list of folks that she knows uh, needs to be connected with, and she's done a great job, her and her team, to make sure that she's checking in on them on a regular basis and providing the services that they need. Uh, and on top of that, we still have maintained our transportation system, so if folks need uh, 
to uh, our, uh, transportation to a medical appointment or transportation to go pick up groceries, our bus continues to run on a daily basis uh, by appointment only. So um, trying to provide all the services that we have in the past outside of uh, physically entering the building itself. Very good, thanks. Great. Um, any new business? No. Uh, just something that came to mind last week's uh, or two weeks ago, Agenda had made mention of the snow operators, right? So I thought we should probably revisit that. And then I was trying to recall if this year we had approved the snow plowing of private ways. And we may have done it and I've forgotten, but I know we typically do it leading up to winter. We have, I think it's something like, oh, maybe eight or 10 private streets that we plow. And I didn't know if we've addressed that yet, you know, in advance of the snow plowing season. So I thought we may want to look at those two agenda items. And uh, I see Dennis is popping on, so maybe he knows if we already addressed that this year or not. I see, I, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on this one. I think through the chair. Yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you. I um, We sent out the, um, the advertisement in July, like like the policy states. We had one street that was identified as requiring some brushback and some pothole repair, and that road was repaired. And all the roads that we normally take care of during the winter for private roads are acceptable. However, you might be right, Mr. Metallion, I don't remember if the board actually voted to accept it this year. You, you probably are correct. Yeah, I did. I did see the list, so I know we saw the list. I don't know. Uh, it's a good point. Though. So let's, let's take that away, Derek. And if we haven't, we'll put it on for the next meeting. Sure. Okay. I know we do it every year. I just don't recall seeing it this year, so I thought we may want to just tie up some loose ends. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you, folks. Uh, appreciate it. We will talk to you all soon. Have a good night. Uh, I'll take a motion. I move that we adjourn. Maureen Dwinell, aye. Second the motion. Stephen Metallian, aye. Brett Simon, aye. Thanks, folks. Have a good night. You Have also.